Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the webcast. Uh, my name is Doug Brake. I'm the Director of Broadband and Spectrum Policy here at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us here today uh, for this discussion on rural broadband. Uh, so for anyone in the audience new to ITIF, we're a think tank based in Washington, D.C., focused on promoting innovation, particularly innovation that can promote economic growth. Obviously, the topic today, very timely, very important, getting the vast majority of the country online connected to broadband is hugely important. Uh, it's a timely topic, too, with pending legislation and the administration's announcement yesterday. Uh, but it's, uh, I think, really remarkable. Now we have real momentum to do something big for, for rural broadband. Uh, but so many questions remain, right? Uh, we're very pleased to have gathered this uh, panel of experts to, dis to discuss uh, a host of issues related to rural broadband. So I'll, I'll introduce uh, each of the individuals uh, more fully in just a bit. Uh, but I will note, you know, we have Burton Heller with uh, National Grange, Paul Garnett, who's the founder and CEO at Vernonberg Group. Carol Maddy, the founder of Maddy Consulting and former FCC official, and Mark Paul, who's the vice president of policy and external affairs at Charter Communications. So a quick note on the run of show, I'm going to give a, a brief presentation, really more of a teaser of a report that we've recently released. I, I believe we should have a link to the report either on the stream or uh, at, at our website. So uh, if you're interested, intrigued by, by some of my notes, uh, it's just a click away with a lot more information. Um, then we're going to hear introductory thoughts from our panel, uh, go, go through each individual in turn, and then have a, you know, a bit of a discussion. I'll have a few questions. Uh, but, but towards the end, I'm hoping to turn towards uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'll be monitoring uh, Twitter uh, to the extent I can. I'm not too distracted. Uh, we'll, we'll be using the hashtag ITIF Broadband. If you'd like to engage on, on Twitter, it's ITIF Broadband. And then we also have a question application uh, integrated within our event webpage on our website as well, our Slido application. So feel free to be submitting questions uh, to the panel throughout the, throughout the presentation, throughout the discussion, uh, and we'll turn to those at the end. Um, so with that, uh, we're, I know we've got an hour, we're kind of tight on time. I'm going to go ahead and jump into uh, a quick presentation just to give our sort of two cents of the issue and some of our proposals around um, how we think that can be, we can best address the, the rural digital divide. Again, these are, these are mostly ideas presented in, in a recent report published by myself and my co-author, Alexander Brewer, the uh, policy analyst for, for broadband policy at ITIF. Um, and, uh, and, and as I mentioned, it should be available on our website. So first of all, I just want to note, uh, we think that there's an extremely strong case for the government subsidizing rural broadband. There's strong economics to broadband deployment, yet in rural areas we see even now, despite the progress that we've made in recent years, uh, there's still about 20% of the of rural areas that are that are unconnected, do not have access to uh, to broadband speeds of of 25 uh, three megabits per second, the current FCC standard. I'd also note this chart, right? This is uh, FCC form 477 data, which uh, by you know most most accounts uh, probably overstates uh, coverage. So the problem is uh, is probably even larger than this. But, uh, but right, there's, a, I think, really strong economic case to, to uh, moving that number up uh, significantly higher, something like 98, uh, even some say 100% uh, coverage. There are positive externalities for jobs, education, healthcare, agriculture, I'm sure we'll get into. And really, the part of the problem is, that, is unsubsidized operators cannot solve this problem alone. It, when you get a uh, you know, sufficiently low population density, there's not sufficient return in high cost areas. Um, to support the, the cost of deployment. Uh, so this is a you know, classic market failure that requires, I think, explicit subsidies uh, to solve. Uh, current problems, right? There, there are uh, a number of existing programs that have uh, you know, made incremental progress, made real progress on this issue. But uh, I think one of the important challenges that maybe isn't widely appreciated is with the funding for the FCC's Universal Service Fund, sort of primary rural subsidy uh, mechanism out there today. Uh, it provides about four and a half billion dollars in annual support for high cost areas. But the challenge is that uh, that's paid for through a base of 
um, really you can think of it as as voice uh, services is a little bit of oversimplification, but but and that base is shrinking as more and more of our communications move over the web for platforms like we're using today. Instead of something like a conference call, uh, the base continues to shrink, and so the 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 rate at which those services are taxed. Uh, continues to increase, and I would anticipate this would take off uh, rather rapidly uh, with the pandemic. Um, so the traditional mechanisms for for funding the support are are I think uh, are are challenged and not sustainable long term. So we've proposed a roadmap, and this is sort of uh, the you know 25 pages condensed into into one slide. But we we've proposed a roadmap to connect rural America. Uh, have put out a couple of different steps that we think are important. First of all, get the maps right. Thankfully, this, this issue has been uh, largely addressed, has been widely debated. The FCC now has you know, a, a task force on this, on this issue, has funding from Congress to, uh, to get high quality maps that have a you know, precise idea of where broadband is available and where it isn't, with what speeds. Uh, second, I think getting into the sort of meat and potatoes of the issue, uh, we call for a large one-time CapEx infusion, an appropriation from Congress that can really take some of the pressure off of the Universal Service Fund. We think that that uh, appropriation should be appropriately targeted, right? The, the goal should be to cost effectively get as many people online as possible rather than, you know, future proofing the network or, um, or unrealistic uh, expectations around the future demands uh, for, for speeds. We want to see us focus first on unserved areas before turning to, to speed upgrades and avoid overbuilding where there's already existing uh, uh, networks by, uh, provided by private providers. We think the reverse auction, a procurement auction, is the right mechanism that, to determine the appropriate technology for any given geographic area. Um, uh, and, and then we have this step four that's admittedly kind of a catch-all of a bunch of different ideas, uh, but we want to see, you know, some, some policy reforms to set the program up for long-term success. Things like reform to um, uh, the credit check process, um, uh, reforms to poll access, um, issues like that that can really, sort of, you know, put it on a glide path to be a much more effective uh, use of, of subsidy dollars than just spending uh, a bunch of money alone. Um, of course, the devil's in the details, right? There's a bunch of debates around uh, around a lot of these questions. Uh, we need to determine, first of all, what's the goal for coverage? Uh, are we aiming to get 100% of the country effect, uh, uh, covered with robust broadband or is 98% sufficient, right? Those last couple of percent, uh, the, the cost to connect goes up rather sharply as you're talking about, you know, northern reaches of Alaska or, or very mountainous regions. Um, we need to determine what speeds count as unserved. Uh, is 25.3, the sort of current uh, standard that the FCC uses, uh, appropriate, makes it a lot easier to coordinate with existing programs, uh, or uh, do people think that that's no longer sufficient? Um, I, I have opinions about all of these, but I'm trying, you know, not to not to lead the witness, and uh, and are, I'm eager to to hear from our from our presenters. Um, we also need to determine what are the target speeds for upgrade, right? Do we trust an auction to determine what speeds we're going to achieve when we're subsidizing networks in rural areas, uh, or do we want to determine that upfront? How serious are we about technological neutrality, right? Do we are we going to say that you know only these types of networks? Um, are sufficient for these uh, for this subsidy program, uh, or do we want it to be a, a neutral uh, program, flexible for different types of technologies for different for different areas? And again, I think it's important you know that we be upfront about the the goal that we're trying to achieve. Are we trying to have cost effective upgrades that get as many people online as possible, and then maybe can put leftover money towards uh, adoption efforts, uh, or, uh, uh, subsidizing uh, low-income uh, broadband, or things of that nature, or are we trying to, you know, quote unquote, future-proof the network and aim for the the highest possible upgrade we can we can achieve uh, throughout the country? I think also important question to to answer up front is what is the role for municipal networks and co-ops, and also uh, how do we deal with satellite offerings that that offer broad coverage but have a very different architecture than a lot of the uh, access technologies that we've subsidized in the past. So there's a lot of information. Uh, again, I don't want to make this uh, this whole panel about uh, about us and our work. I'm very eager to hear from our experts. Um, but uh, but if these uh, ideas and questions are intriguing to you, I encourage you to to uh, to check out the uh, check out the um, 
uh, the rest of the report. So with that, I, I think we'll turn to the, uh, the panel. Um, and I think we, sh we could kick things off with, uh, with Burton. Um, so a full, full bio is available on our website, but uh, Burton is the legislative director at National Grange. Grange is, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, Grange is the oldest national agriculture advocacy group in the United States, founded in 1867. It has a membership of over 160,000 members. Burton directs the legislative advocacy efforts of the Grange. He has had a career long involvement in development of agricultural ad advocacy from his personal history as an owner of a family farm to his tenure serving as deputy undersecretary at the US Department of Agriculture. So Burton, I'm hoping that, that you can help us ground the discussion and uh, give us a sense of why rural broadband is important. Uh, is this something we're subsidi subsidizing um, and sort of your background and, and thoughts on, uh, on how you know, your expertise in agriculture and rural areas uh, intersects with uh, broadband policy. I'll turn it over to you for your thoughts. Well, thank you, Doug. And I really appreciate you and the ITIF putting on this webinar. And I really appreciate the title of your report, uh, To Solve Rood, uh, Rural Broadband Issues Once and for All. I, I'm, I've underlined that in the big yellow uh, markers. The uh, Grange has been uh, involved in rural America, as you know, since the Civil War. It was founded to uh, reestablish agriculture after the war-torn Civil War in uh, most of the country, but especially the South. Uh, it quickly spread uh, all over the country to the northern states uh, because there was a need for community, for some uh, common uh, approach in agriculture. Uh, no matter what your philosophy was, you were together on agriculture and community needs and, and the things that affected rural citizens. The Grange was very involved uh, in, in, in the rural um, sociology, the rural politics, the rural policy uh, from its beginning. It uh, helped form rural co-ops in the late 1800s. Um, the uh, Sears Roebuck uh, catalog uh, was first founded for Grange members, uh, and that's the first uh, group of folks that ordered out of the old Ro uh, Sears Roebuck catalog, and Sears followed thereafter. Uh, perhaps related to this issue, the Grange was very involved in the 20s and 30s in getting rural electrification into rural America, followed by rural telephone. And those, uh, have, of course, are uh, stand-ups again today. We still have rural telephone co-ops. We still have uh, rural electric co-ops. In fact, at my home, uh, we're on a rural electric co-op, um, and we, you know, it, it, it brought America uh, out of the dark. Oh, I'm sorry. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure if we've lost, lost Burton or lost myself, to be honest with you. But, uh, but maybe in the meantime, we can uh, go ahead and turn to our, our next presenter to get, uh, to get initial thoughts from, from Paul. Um, Paul Garnett is the founder and CEO of uh, Burnenberg Group. Uh, Burnenberg Group is a consulting outfit focused on the digital divide. Uh, our, our, our conversation here today is, is focused on the US, but Paul's vision is really global. He's working to ensure that all people across the world have access to affordable high-speed internet connections. Paul's deeply versed in a variety of low-cost technologies that can help bridge the digital divide. I should know, uh, prior to founding the Burnberg Group, Paul was senior director of Microsoft's Airband Initiative. Some of you in the audience may be familiar with that. Um, so Paul, I'm curious if you can, um, I don't know, tell us about your initial thoughts on, on these issues. Um, uh, but, but in particular, I'm curious if you could tell us, you know, a little bit about different, some of the different access technologies that are, uh, that are out there, um, and if there are some technologies that are better suited to rural areas than others. But, but with that, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Um, hopefully lightning strikes only once and uh, my, my screen won't freeze up as well. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank uh, the ITIF for inviting me to participate in this in this discussion. And um, also, it's great to be, you know, sharing the this uh, agenda with with these esteemed panelists. Um, uh, one of which I used to work for at the FCC. I won't tell you who, but um, but it's great to be uh, on a, on a panel with her. Um, 
So uh, I also wanted just to congratulate Doug and Alexandra for their for their paper. It's it's I thought it was quite good, and there's a lot of really good ideas in there um, uh, on things like broadband definitions, um, use of reverse auctions for uh, for universal service subsidies, uh, you know, ideas around technology neutrality, uh, the use of vouchers, uh, which I think is something that that people should take uh, a closer look at in the U.S. and um, also the idea of paying for uh, for funding out of appropriations uh, to, to uh, minimize distortions in the marketplace, um, I think these are all these are all really interesting ideas, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, we can uh, pursue those uh, more. Um, in terms of your question um, on last mile access technologies, um, I think overall the the news is great. Um, I think we're at a time. Uh, in this industry where internet service providers have have more options than ever. Um, there's more, there are more technologies out there for them to be able to utilize to bring broadband to unserved and underserved um, areas than, uh, than ever before. And that's, that's really, that's really great. Um, you know, whenever, whenever, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be in a conversation with, with engineers and, and someone, someone inevitably would ask, you know, what's the best uh, technology for bringing broadband access to, to unserved uh, rural communities. Uh, the engineer's answer always is it depends. Um, uh, and, you know, of course, that, that causes a bit of frustration sometimes to, to the uninitiated. But, but the answer is it really does depend on a lot of different vari variables. And, um, uh, you know, the good news is there are, there are a nice mix of technologies and, and, uh, and you will pick and choose which technologies make the most sense depending on um, a, a variety of different um, uh, variables. Really, uh, it's, you know, the way we look at it is a, it's a toolkit approach. So you've got a nice, you know, box full of tools and you pick the right tool for the right, the right um, uh, kind of application, the right use case. Um, I think oftentimes we see, uh, in, especially in marketing, um, uh, some companies will claim that their technology is the solution to all problems. And, um, you know, I, I think those kind of, those kind of claims really lack credibility. Um, uh, it really is a toolkit approach. So you'll you'll look at, you know, what is the throughput you want to deliver to customers? You know, what are the costs um, that you would need to incur to do that? What is the, you know, what is the profile of the customer? What can they afford? Um, you know, what's the population density? What's the topography? Um, what's the application you want to deliver? You, you know, fiber is great, but it's not going to be all that useful for a, a you know, a soil sensor in a, in a farmer's field. Um, you'll need you'll need a mix of um, you know, fiber perhaps to the farmhouse and, and some kind of wireless technology out in the fields. Um, so it's really a mix. It's, you know, you, you know, you've got a whole variety of technologies, fiber, coax, millimeter wave um, in high density areas. Um, so if I'm, and, and the, one of the other things about rural areas is they, they often are a mix of, um, of, of different types of profiles. Um, I think sometimes, you know, those of us who live in big cities think of an area as rural and you ask the person who lives in that area, do you live in a rural area? And they'll tell you that, no, I live in the biggest town and, you know, hundred miles. Um, and it, you know, within that town, there's density. Uh, and so they, it ends up looking you know, from a profile perspective, a lot more like an urban area, um, in, in terms of connectivity. So if I'm in a, if I'm in a, in a high density, urban, suburban area, you know, you want to look at things like fiber, um, you know, perhaps some, uh, some of these new millimeter wave technologies would be useful. Um, uh, but, you know, technologies primarily, um, uh, and, uh, and then perhaps some, some mix of wireless uh, where that makes sense. Um, as you get out into lower population density um, uh, areas, um, you, you, you use fiber less and you use wireless, terrestrial wireless technologies more. Um, and as I said before, there's a great mix of, of different types of terrestrial wireless technologies out there. Anything from, you know, millimeter wave technologies using using uh, uh, the higher spectrum bands to the, the mid band technologies like in five and now uh, are going to be in six gigahertz, uh, three and a half gigahertz CBRS um, uh, band uh, technologies, two gigahertz spaces in pl places where you really need range and, and um, obstacle penetration. Um, so you use, a, you use a mix of technologies. And then as you get to even more rural areas where the population density doesn't even support uh, terrestrial uh, uh, technologies, you'll start to look at things like satellite um, for connectivity. Uh, and again, there we have um, you know, more options uh, becoming available. Um, and we have some great US companies that, that, uh, that provide um, satellite connectivity. So companies like Viasat that already are out there with their various geo um, 
uh, stationary technologies, and then you've got emerging companies like Starlink uh, uh, and Amazon Kuiper, um, uh, which are doing Leo uh, uh, technology de uh, deployments, um, which which offer more bandwidth and um, and lower latencies uh, for for broadband connectivity. Um, and then I think there's a couple other things just to mention um, from a technology perspective that are interesting um, and that, are, that have been emerging in, in the last few years. Um, so I think the first thing is, is um, you know, bringing the cloud to the edge of networks. Uh, you know, in the early days of cloud, it was all about massive scale, hyperscale and massive data centers. And, and you place those in a few places around the country and, and around the world. Uh, and now, now we're at this point where it's like, okay, great, we've got the, we've got the massive data centers. Now we've got to bring the cloud closer to the customer, um, so that we can uh, optimize the performance for them and perhaps uh, tax the network a little less. Um, so that's definitely a, a, a trend that is it, that we're in the midst of right now. Um, another area is Open RAN, uh, which really has kind of taken off in the last couple of years um, with incredible momentum. And I think we could probably thank Facebook for a lot of uh, what um, got that going. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that is this whole idea of disaggregating pieces of, of, uh, of, uh, of mobile wireless 5, 5G networks uh, between uh, the, the, uh, the hardware and the, and the, and the software. Uh, and and that, that's a great development and hopefully we'll reduce co further reduce costs for ISPs. Uh, and then the other area that that's, that's interesting and emerging, I see less of it in the U.S. and more of it overseas is, network as a service kind of models. Um, uh, for example, Telefonica has some deployments in, in uh, Latin America in a project called Internet para Todos, where they're doing basically wholesale open access networks, uh, 4G um, wholesale open access networks, where they're basically bringing the, the tower infrastructure and the, uh, the radio access network, and then basically providing wholesale access to internet service providers. And that's a shift from CapEx to OpEx and, and helps a lot of uh, smaller ISPs um, get to market um, without worrying as much about raising huge amounts of capital to do so. So that's just a kind of an overview in response to to your question, and I look forward to the the, the discussion. Thanks. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Um, so I think Burton is back with us. Um, if we can turn back to him, uh, these are uh, great technologies being able to connect in these times, but uh, but so many things can go wrong. So sorry we lost you, Burton. Uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, your comments, yeah. Okay, our office is one block from the White House, and uh, we lost connectivity. So I, that shows you we still have a problem in urban America as well as rural America, maybe. Uh, quickly, let me just get to, uh, through a couple of things, and then we can do questions if you like. But, uh, you know, the uh, rural electrification and the rural telephone uh, in the 20s and 30s opened up rural America. Uh, roads and bridges came shortly after that, and uh, we were ready for World War II. Had we not had these developments, we wouldn't have been ready for World War II. We couldn't have gotten supplies to where they needed to be as fast as they needed to be and, and the orders delivered. So the Grange was uh, very active and we're looking forward to this next uh, advancement in, in, in rural history of information um, sharing. Um, the Grange has been basically the number one issue for the Grange uh, in, uh, in, in the rural community for over a decade has been broadband uh, deployment. It was very slow, uh, a lot of lip service and not much action. Um, then we had Chairman Pai, uh, love him or hate him or know him or not, uh, he was raised in rural and small town America. We didn't have to spell rural for Chairman Pai. We probably made more uh, uh, political and uh, policy advancements in the last two or three years than we'd made in over the previous decade because of just awareness and the, uh, the commitment to do something about it. Then came COVID, um, and, and you hear a lot of stories of COVID, but in rural America, uh, it was real uh, as a virus and as an isolation uh, to, uh, uh, issue. Uh, in my home county, school buses ran every day. They weren't dropping off and picking up kids. They were dropping off homework and picking up homework and dropping school meals five days a week. We had Grange Halls that uh, set up Wi-Fi's so folks could come in and, and, and connect. Um, mobile hotspots, if you get one, uh, at community crossroads were lifesavers. Um, driving 30 miles to a library for a college student that was isolated at home was maybe the only way to get a, a project done. Um, so we... Uh, 
you know, we're, we're looking forward to solving these issues. The um, issue is now, where do we go from here? Um, one good thing that COVID did for rural America was to place the spotlight on digital deserts, both urban centers and in rural America. I mean, I would never have believed that downtown uh, Detroit had uh, rural uh, or had broadband uh, deserts. Uh, we knew that there were broadband deserts in rural America. Um, and both of them probably have come about to some extent by the big pay for issue. Uh, it, it's possible to connect every human being in America, but what's the cost and, uh, and how do we do it? Um, what we have to understand too, that unlike the core of Detroit, there's a big space out in rural America. You have two big things. You've got topography and you've got miles. And in most of those cases, you've got distance between locations that you need to connect. Um, in the middle of town, you can use one pole for a lot of homes. In rural America, you will use a lot of poles for one home. And you know, we, we need your advice. Um, it, it appears that there's no one size fits all. Uh, as we look around uh, at what's working and what's not and what's out there that we don't know what will work is... Uh, you know, is, is it mixed tech technology? We know that uh, that in many cases, this or that won't work. Um, my first experience with broadband was a satellite dish and, and, and dial up. And so, you know, you have those memories that say, hey, you know, we, we can we can do this a lot better. Um, and, and, and Congress has put a lot of money and uh, political will and commitment behind expanding brood, uh, broadband in rural America. Um, now, the issue is, it's not just about money. It's not just about politics. It's about the can do, and then it's about to pay for. And so how are we going to get access and how are we going to make it affordable? And, you know, we appreciate the, you know, the discussion you're having because those are the big issues in our minds. And everyone doesn't need the same connectivity, smart agriculture, needs the highest gigabytes you can put out there in the, in, in, in the area where you can reach it. Uh, for Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, uh, Minnesota, uh, we can probably reach a long way with gigabyte because we've got sight, uh, a lot of sight. Um, you get into the mountains of the west and the mountains of the east and the rolling Piedmonts and, and foothills, uh, you don't have that. So it's going to be a hard, lot harder to get smart agriculture into those areas. Um, do we need uh, 25, three all over the country? Do we need 120 over the whole whole country? No, probably. And, and I think a challenge um, is going to be how do we fit rural America for what fits rural America? And so I, we're, we're interested in uh, being part of this uh, uh, exploration over the next few years. Uh, I, we, we just hope that it gets started right because uh, we don't want to have to come back in 10, 15 years and, and correct all this. Excellent. Thanks so much, Burton. Appreciate those comments. Um, next, I think we'll hear from Carol Matty. Uh, Carol Matty, as I mentioned, is the founder of Matty Consulting. We're very lucky uh, to have Carol. I mean, we're lucky both on the panel to have her with uh, invite to have here today, but I feel like we're also lucky as a country, Carol has been super invested for, for years in uh, really transitioning uh, a lot of the uh, FCC's universal service programs and modernizing them for, for the broadband era. Um, she has decades of experience as a senior executive in the U.S. government. Most notably, Carol was recently the deputy chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau at the FCC. Um, so, Carol, I, uh, you're an expert's expert. Uh, you have deep experience with the you know, previous uh, uh, efforts to connect rural America. Um, and now we're talking about, you know, a potential big uh, legislative package uh, to make changes that, you know, maybe you didn't have the, the flexibility that you had to, to, to change when you were at the FCC and sort of constrained by the existing statute. So I'm curious, you know, your general thoughts and, you know, any lessons learned from, from uh, your time at the FCC prior efforts to, to connect America. Over to you. Sure, and thanks for that introduction and, and um, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's great to be talking about these issues. As you said, I've been working on this for more than a decade and it's my passion. 
Um, I worked on these issues at the FCC, and, and you rightly point out that the FCC in doing the reforms that stemmed from the National Broadband Plan in some respect was constrained. And one of the recommendations in the National Broadband Plan was that Congress should appropriate $20 billion to sort of kickstart investment in getting broadband deployed in the areas that needed it. And obviously that didn't happen. And, and fundamentally, we were forced to use an existing mechanism, the Universal Service Fund, to accomplish what admittedly is a hu huge task. Um, and, and, and doing that against the backdrop of a long history of doing things in a particular way and then trying to transition to another way. One of my you know, biggest regrets, to be honest, is it took so long. Um, you know, it, everything always takes longer than, than you hope for, and this was no exception to that general rule. Um, but I think one of the other lessons I learned was that uh, it, it's difficult for government to forecast far into the future. And over the years, as I would go to speaking engagements, I would get a lot of flack when I would go to conferences about the fact that the initial vision for the Connect America Fund was for one, you know, four megabits down, one up, and then, you know, continued to get flack at various events I would go to, even when the FCC upped it to 10-1. And I think, you know, we can all debate what the right um, number should be, you know, going forward. But it, it, I think it's fair, and most people would agree that um, the, the the decisions that were made in the past were too incremental, and that we need to be more forward-looking, as you say in your paper's title. You know, let's solve this for once and for all. Um, another thing I learned was that, unfortunately. Um, there are no easy answers and government policymakers, to be really blunt about it, have a hard time making hard decisions. All too often, government um, basically is trying to maximize on every goal and, 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 and refusing to make the hard choices. And I'll just, as one illustration of that, you know, in the National Broadband Plan and subsequently in the FCC's implementation of reforms, you know, we we set out a vision that we would, you know, use, um, you know, the goal, you know, would be to get broadband to 99% or 98% of the country, and then we would use alternative technologies for the last one or two percent. Well, what I soon learned as we move forward in that, that idea may sound good in theory and people can look at it and say that's economically rational. But when, when people and when members of Congress find out their constituents happen to live in that last 1%, then everybody goes ballistic and says, well, no, we, we want the same thing that everybody else has. And it's difficult for policymakers to make those trade-offs as to how, where do you draw the line in terms of how you do it? Um, I want to echo some of the comments that earlier panels have made. Um, it's very, very clear to me that rural America is not homogenous. It is not the same. And policymakers need to keep that into account. Um, different geographic areas, some geographic areas, frankly, all they need is CapEx uh, support to get broadband deployed and the density is sufficient and service providers may have natural inherent assets that make it possible for them to serve the market without subsidy once they get that CapEx boost. Um, but there are other areas of the country where the density is so low that there is a need for ongoing support. Um, likewise, you know, I've learned, you know, there are some areas of the country where the existing service providers want to serve the market, and then there are others where the existing um, service provider really isn't, that isn't their highest business priority to serve the market. And I think policy needs to take that into account, trying to find ways to tailor solutions that sort of play both to the geography and the nature of the service providers of who wants to serve a particular area. Um, and the last thing that I think I, I've learned over over time is things have evolved tremendously in terms of the level of interest and actually resources that are be de being dedicated to this issue at the state level. Um, obviously, we're talking now about federal policies, but you know, when I started working on this back in 2010, there were just a small handful of states that were providing any sort of funding um, 
to extend networks within their jurisdictions. And in the last five years, it has really exploded with state governments um, setting up broadband offices and setting up dedicated funding streams to actually provide state grants. And so one of the challenges as we move ahead with the infrastructure package um, that's going to be debated in the months ahead is how do these federal and state efforts work together? Because that's a really important question. Um, and with that, I'll stop and um, you know, happy to talk more. I could talk about this topic for hours. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you could. Yeah, thank you so much, Carol. Appreciate your your comments. Um, let's let's keep moving right along. We'll, next, we'll go to uh, Mark Paul. Uh, Mark is the Vice President of Policy and Exter External Affairs at Charter Communications. We were eager to have uh, someone from Charter come join the panel. Very glad to have have Mark, uh, uh, but uh, a recent announcement from Charter, a big deployment, right? You're combining, the company's combining, uh, I believe it's $3.8 billion of your own investment with $1.2 billion that you won in the recent uh, uh, the World Digital Opportunity Fund, the recent FCC high cost auction. Um, and so very curious to hear about that. Mark, you have a ton of experience in all, all sorts of policy arenas. You served at the FCC, on the Hill, in private practice. You've seen these issues from, from a number of different angles uh, in DC. Um, but yeah, uh, so Mark, curious your thoughts, just sort of generally your, your take on these issues, um, and, and in particular curious about uh, you know, Charter's participation in the RDOF and, uh, and sort of what influenced that decision. No, really, really appreciate um, that introduction and, and I'll echo what others have said. It's really an honor to be on this panel with everyone. Um, this is a this is a great group and, and these are some some policy giants. So I, I, I really feel honored to be here today. I think, um, you know, I, I'm genuinely excited to talk about this issue, um, you know, not only um, uh, you know, kind of as an individual, um, I, I think it's so important um, getting more and more people connected in this country. Um, but I'm also excited when I'm wearing my charter hat here too, because the company is really doing some great things uh, to get out there and to, and to get into rural America and get more and more people uh, served uh, with broadband. So um, that's something to get excited about. So, and, and the whole company is really excited about that. Just just to, I'll just quickly, you know, summarize um, a little bit more of, of what, you know, Doug said in terms of Charter, just for those who, who may not know. Uh, Charter did um, win as part of the FCC's recent art off auction, uh, just over a billion dollars um, uh, of, of government funding, which it's going to combine with close to four billion of its, of, of its own private capital. To, to then combine that and to reach more than what the FCC estimates to be um, about a million unserved locations across 24 states. So we're, we're that that's a reason why we're, we're, we're so excited because we're going to be providing real, real robust uh, internet broadband services to, to many people who don't have service. Um, we plan to deliver a, a one gigabit per second fiber to the home network, low latency with starting speeds of 200 megabits per second down. So it, it, it really, um, you know, is a, is a first class network that we're going to be bringing to communities that don't have it. Um, you know, I, I think in, in, in some ways a, a good place for me to just kind of start is kind of, you know, why, you know, like why participate in, in, in art off. Uh, as, as a company like Charter. And, and I think really this art off participation by Charter is a, really an important part uh, of our ongoing build out effort. Um, and, and so serving rural America is definitely a big part of that. Um, but it's not something that's new for Charter. I mean, it's in our DNA. If you look at our footprint across 41 states across this country, uh, rural America is right there and, and we want to provide service. And, and, you know, our past has kind of shown that we put in, uh, I think, um, around $40 billion in infrastructure and technology over the last five years. Uh, and that's something that we're really, really proud of. And it's led, you know, to connecting really more than two and a half million homes and businesses over the last three years, uh, one third of which is in rural areas. So 
we are very much committed uh, to closing the technolo technological divide, digital divide. Um, we feel like we've made a lot of progress, but at the same time, I think there is a recognition in the company that there are still some remaining gaps that need to be filled, whether they be access or affordability adoption gaps. And we want to be part of that solution. And we think that's really good for communities. It's good for our business. It's, it's, and it's just the right thing to do. Um, and so we're not resting on the past investment. And hopefully this, this art off, our, our participation in an art off and um, uh, our, our committing additional private capital shows that this is an ongoing effort you know, for, for our company and, and others in the industry to get more locations connected. Um, and the, the great thing about art off is it helps to take areas of the country that would be economically challenging to serve, uh, makes them more economical. Uh, and, and we're, we're kind of putting, you know, our own capital with that public money, uh, in a, in a great targeted public private partnership, uh, to get people connected. Um, and, and just to put, you know, this commitment into perspective, which is sometimes hard to do uh, when you hear these kind of numbers being thrown around, it, you know, th this effort is going to add around 115,000 miles of network infrastructure over the next seven years. Um, someone told me in the company that's long enough to circle uh, the globe more than four and a half times, which I nearly fell out of my seat. Um, so it, this is a substantial commitment to rural America. We're not deploying a second rate network. This is a robust network that can serve uh, and satisfy next generation dem demands. So, and we feel that, you know, we have the capabilities to, to, to do this and we have a track record for doing it. Um, just before I can conclude, I, I know we want to get to questions and so forth. I, I, I did just want to mention that, you know, and hopefully the flavor comes across from, from everyone on the panel that building out in rural America is hard. It's a challenge. Um, and, and, and I think any discussion of building out broadband uh, into rural America needs to focus not only on network costs, um, and, but also addressing other impediments to deployment that may be out there. And I, I really uh, commend uh, ITIF um, uh, that the recent rural broadband paper, because I think it, it does a really nice job of identifying some of those other impediments that need to be addressed, um, like the excessive pole replacement cost, pole attachment issues that really need to be addressed in order to make sure that deployments are cost efficient uh, in rural America. With, and with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll wind up and turn it back to Doug. Fantastic, thanks, Mark. Um, so I think we can go ahead and, and bring everyone into the uh, virtual room for, uh, for a more open discussion. Um, I, think, I think it makes sense to start. Uh, obviously yesterday, a lot of news around this issue uh, with the administration uh, announcing their, at least sort of the, the high level uh, 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 details around the, their infrastructure proposal, right? We're still awaiting the actual uh, nuts and bolts, but, but at least from the, the fact sheet that was put out yesterday, um, it looks like the Biden administration has very big ambitions in this in this arena um, uh, and indicated that they would propose one hundred billion dollars for a future proof network. Not not exactly sure what that means, but it tends to indicate, you know, higher speed tier and, and potentially particular uh, particular types of technologies um, uh, indicate a prioritization of funding for municipality and uh, co-op run networks. Uh, rather than the uh, existing sort of private uh, uh, private investment uh, funded networks. And then also there was a, a um, at least a sort of an indication to potential efforts around um, price controls, indicating that they are going to try to, to push down prices for for all Americans. So uh, I mean by on the sort of uh, scale of, of modest to ambitious, it seems like a very big ambitious, um, progressive uh, 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 goal uh, put out there by the administration. So maybe it makes sense to, to uh, once again kind of go down the line. 
Um, and Carol, you mentioned you mentioned things always taking longer than expected. I find that's that's true with panels as well. So if we could try to keep these uh, these comments relatively relatively tight, but I'm but but obviously you know a big piece of news uh, would be great to get each of yours reaction perspective to the announcement yesterday. Um, might make sense to go in the same order. Uh, Burton, do you have uh, particular uh, thoughts on? Uh, I know you were more an agriculture guy than an infrastructure guy, but but curious if you have uh, reaction thoughts on uh, on the administration's proposal. Well, first of all, uh, you know, not just with infrastructure or broadband, but the Grange membership uh, has policy going back a century that um, good government is small government, and uh, I, I I think the the route that takes us to government price controls. Uh, would not be looked at favorably in our membership in rural America. Um, we're smart enough to understand that price controls have never worked in this country. Uh, price controls stymie innovation, and uh, our country's been built on the free market system. And um, I, I hope that we don't go down that road. Great, thanks, Paul. Your your thoughts on the on the administration's proposal? Um. Yeah, the, I think the price can, the pricing issue is pretty provocative, um, and you know it's almost like I don't even know. Like it's hard, it's hard to imagine in the U.S. that with that uh, after after broadband having not been price regulated for its entire existence for 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 now there to be price controls put in place. Um, I think another area that that um, is a little bit worrisome is this whole idea that that. Um, that you know symmetrical broadband speeds get legislated um and uh i mean the simple fact is that people don't consume broadband symmetrically today um uh even on even on calls like this um so i think um i think that you know we should let the market kind of decide you know that issue i think it's, it's clear that the broadband definition is going to change regardless of what Congress does, um, the number is likely to go up and I hope it doesn't become a symmetrical uh, speed because then you're basically locking out a whole bunch of other really you know, innovative and low cost technologies that could really do the job alongside things that are symmetrical. Um, and then one area that um, that's not in, in the conversation right now uh, with the legislation, which I think is something that um, I, I wish people would focus more on. Uh, and if you sort of, if you look at like, some of the consumer surveying and like Pew does surveying on this on, on, from time to time, even in situations where broadband becomes available um, to customers and even when it's affordable, you know, where, where the consumer says they're not concerned about price, they still don't subscribe to it. And one of the biggest issues is digital skills. And um, and we've seen this in, in, the, in the COVID um, uh, pandemic, uh, both at both ends of the of the, the age scale, right? So, with young kids um, uh, and and a accessing uh, educational content, but but I think probably even more importantly for older folks, getting access to vaccines, and and not just not having the skills to get online and figure it all out. Um, so I think um, I think the digital skilling is an area. You know, we're going to get to this point where. Broadband's ubiquitously available, it's affordable, and yet still we're stuck with 20 to 30% of households not signing up. And um, the biggest barrier is gonna be digital skills, lack of skills. And I think there's more I think we ought to be doing there, um, more that government can be doing as well as the private sector. A lot of a lot of great points there, Paul. Thank you. I, I totally agree. If, if we're talking about $100 billion and the, the wide scope of the digital divide, right? There's a lot we could do with $100 billion. Um, I think it's a, you know reasonable to ask, you know, how much of it goes towards infrastructure, how much of it goes towards uh, uh, other uh, broadband adoption issues or, or digital skills, as mentioned. Um, I believe uh, next, Carol, if uh, your, your quick thoughts on, on sure. uh, the administration's proposal. Yeah, thank you. Sure, well, just following up on that, I actually read the fact sheet as saying there would be a $100 billion investment in broadband, but I didn't read it as saying all of that would necessarily go to infrastructure because the sub bullet about affordability was under that $100 billion. So I read it as a $100 billion commitment towards both deployment and adoption slash affordability. Um, so, as you said in your opening remarks, Doug, as always, the devil's going to be in the details as to how it all shakes out. This is just a high level kind of marker in the sand, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth 
going through. I think one of the most important things from my perspective is that it's really important to have different standards for which areas are eligible for subsidies and what we want the minimum requirements to be for whichever entity is awarded the funding to build. Um, and we can debate what those standards should be. Um, and there may be different opinions, but I think it's a mistake to say that what we're expecting people to build with government money is going to determine which areas are eligible. And, and in particular, I think we need to focus the funding in the first instance on the areas that have, you know, whatever you want it, whatever you want to call it, lower speed, less robust broadband. And it does not make sense. It really doesn't make sense. And I'll just put it out there. This is my personal opinion. Like, it does not make sense for the federal government to be subsidizing providers to be overbuilding cable operators. Um, you know, that's just like my personal opinion. Um, you know, like we really need to be focusing on the areas that um, in the first instance, you know, don't have, you know, decent service and then and then in time you know you can inch out to other areas as as standards evolve but it just like we shouldn't be you know i don't think it makes sense to sort of open up the whole country for government subsidies and you know but we'll see how this all plays out right 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 uh mark uh, over to you. well when given the opportunity to agree with carol maddie i'm going to agree <laughs> with carol maddie um how can you argue with now, her i will um, say there may be some cable that I wouldn't say that for, but like there's 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 good cable and not great cable, but like just big picture, you know, like no, I don't need no. anybody overbuilding my cable here in Bethesda, Maryland. And and I think that that makes a makes a lot of sense, uh, Carol. And and I guess you know the one thing I would say just in terms of reactions to to yesterday, from my perspective, in in some ways I'm still trying to get my head around it all between you know, stimulus packages that were passed last year, we had money for broadband and we had something earlier this year. It, it's, you know, I, I'm having a hard time kind of keeping track of where, you know, kind of the money, money is going. Um, and, and I, um, you know, so that's one thing I'm still trying to get a handle on, but I, I guess I view, you know, yesterday's announcement as the beginning of the, of, of a conversation. And, you know, the, the thing that, you know, struck me was it, it it almost felt like there there needs to be a better understanding of of the important progress that has been made in in, in many places of the con country and by existing networks. And it just it does just seem counterproductive, as as Carol said, in certain places to overbuild networks. It just doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, given how much progress has been made in certain places. But, you know, as I said earlier, I, you know, from, from Charter's perspective, we recognize there are still gaps and, and we need targeted solutions to deal with those those gaps. And, and we want to be part of that solution. But um, to, to treat everywhere as if, you know, broadband is completely inadequate across the whole country just doesn't seem to me to be kind of the, the right approach. So definitely looking forward to having a good conversation with, with the administration and the Hill and, and so forth about all of this and how to solve it. Great, thanks. So, uh, Paul, you mentioned uh, this issue of symmetry. I think it's worth. I think this is one of the sort of key questions that's that's worth digging in a little deeper. Um, and uh, maybe Carol, we could get your thoughts, and, and Mark, and then any, anyone else if they want to jump in. But uh, but some of the pending legislation on the Hill, this uh, um, uh, bill from uh, Whip Clyburn and and Klobuchar, uh, and a few others, right? Would would explicitly expect you know the some of the definitions to be centered around a symmetrical network that has equal download speeds and upload speeds and this obviously you know determines what areas count as served or unserved and also the technology that could potentially be used to uh, to bring service to those areas um I, i'm skeptical that this is a wise approach but uh the you know, given the actual use of uh, of networks that uh, that uh, we don't, uh, the symmetrical uh, networks are not necessary would reduce our flexibility and add costs. But but Carol, I'm I'm curious your your thoughts on this issue of of symmetry, and then maybe Mark or if anyone else wants to jump in. Well, I, I'll say I'll start out at the outset. I'm not an engineer, um, and so I I don't have the deep understanding of this issue. Um, I myself question whether symmetry is necessary. Um, 
But I also think there is a need for greater upload speeds than our current standards. And I'll just use a small anecdote for myself. You know, this summer during COVID, I had um, several adult children join me at a second home that we have in another location, which is served by a major co co cable operator. I won't say who. Um, and basically, the week of 4th of July, we could not have four people working simultaneously because it was four adults all actively working with, you know, you know, conference calls, Zoom calls, et cetera, et cetera. And, and basically, it was not, it, it didn't work, it just didn't work. Um, so I don't know what the right number is, but I will say that some of the current capabilities may need to be upped. Um, Maybe we need to come up with three, but maybe not. You know, I don't know. I don't know numbers. what the I don't know what the number is. And and I, honestly, and I, you know, at the time I was like desperately doing speed tests, trying to figure out what level of service we were getting from this unknown major cable operator. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I just it was a real life experience to me about how in a world where you've got multiple people engaging in interactive communications, you do actually need, you know, more robust capabilities than perhaps, um, you know, we've been taking for granted up until now. I mean, one idea, one idea is, I mean, so I think it's it's true that that consumption is becoming more symmetrical over time. I don't think it is symmetrical yet, and I don't think it will be for a long time. Um, just in the, in the way we, we consume bandwidth. Um, but one, one idea, and I, and I think the broadband definition is going to change. I think there's, there's enough, you know, eventually we're going to have to, you know, it's been six years since the FCC did 25.3, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it goes up. Um, one interesting idea I came across was the Chilean regulator, where they basically have a, a basically an inflator, an annual inflator on the, um, the broadband definition. So instead of you know expecting the broad, the regulator to come back to the issue with some frequency every year, the number goes up a little bit, um, and uh, and you could do it so that the the upstream speed goes up faster than the downstream um, speed over time. So you get closer to sym symmetry like over a decade period. Um, I think those are kind of interesting ideas um, that we might want to look at. If, if I could respond to that, Paul raises a really okay. important point, which ties back to, you know, when I say government, it takes a long time. Um, things that you can do to build in what I call self-effectuating mechanisms that rely on market forces, in my view, is a really good idea. Um, as opposed to having a situation where the regulators have to make a decision. Now, I realize in some contexts it may lead you to a place that, you know, then regulators get uncomfortable. And, you know, I'll use Lifeline as the example, the minimum standards for Lifeline. But, you know, in the Connect America Fund, we adopted a requirement that usage allowances would have to evolve over time and be reflective of what the median is for US usage. And, you know, while we started out at 150 gigabits, like usage has gone up and every year the Bureau puts out a survey saying what the usage allowance is going to be, which is based on a survey. Um, and, and, and it's not a political decision that's being made on an annual basis by the commission. It's just really reflective of what is happening in the marketplace. And isn't that the point? You know, you want, you want, universal service to be tracking what's going on in the marketplace so that people are having you know, similar experiences. And, you know, I'll, I'll just quickly add, I mean, in, in talking about the marketplace, I mean, certainly within Charter, uh, you know, we see, you know, competition and, and the need to innovate. And so we're trying to, you know, push our networks forward, whether it's you know evolving our Doxis uh, te technology to to get increase speeds and meet consumer demand, or making decisions like it, with Ardoff, our Ardoff build is going to be a fiber build. We're we're really looking to maximize uh, our network and look towards the future. Um, and, and I do think that that's important because ultimately we, we got to answer to the consumer. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're definitely trying to innovate, uh, and make sure our networks meet demand. So I regret we're, we are already coming up at time. Uh, this is a conversation that we, we really should have allocated more like 
two or three hours to, to talk through all the issues. But we have a, just a couple of quick minutes. Um, if anyone has, you know, burning thoughts, I know it's like, I don't know, at least for myself, always after these panels, it's like, oh, there's all this, that, and the other thing that I wanted to discuss but didn't get to. Are there any key issues that you think that nobody's touched on yet? Um, uh, maybe, Mark, do you have any any uh, final parting thoughts or anyone else, any um, any key issues that, that haven't come up before before we wrap? I, you know, look, I, I, I guess I, I alluded to it a little bit in, in my opening remarks. I, I think it's so important when we talk about rural America to like Carol and I think Paul and Burton, you know, all said is to make sure it's not one size fits all uh, and, and to really examine what the impediments are in a particular area in terms of getting uh, broadband deployed, whether, you know, it means, you know, dealing with poll issues or dealing with the way the technology, uh, you know, it, you really have to have kind of a, an open mind and really try to tackle a wide range of issues. Carol, Paul, Burton, any any parting thoughts before we, uh, we say thank you and goodbye? I have one, which is, I think, it's necessary for Congress and policymakers to look at the bigger picture. When everybody says, how are we gonna pay for it? It's gonna cost a hundred billion dollars. We need to take a step back and think about what are the benefits to the broader economy and healthcare and education. If we can say, you know, if we spend a hundred billion dollars to get broadband everywhere and make it affordable so people can use it. What savings are we gonna achieve, for instance, in telemedicine and healthcare and other important sectors of the economy? So we have to stop looking at it as this little narrow issue about like how much is it gonna cost and think about what savings are we gonna achieve across the entire governmental ecosystem? So that's my parting thought. Totally agree. A huge sum of benefits. Um, having everyone be able to operate, assuming that everyone else is online, would create so many efficiencies. So I strongly agree. Any other parting thoughts? Well, Doug, you've got a whole issue of education in rural America that uh, it's not only, uh, uh, as you pointed out, several panelists, that it's not only access, but it's uh, adaptability. And um, I, I believe that the School children growing up now uh, not only have to have access, but they're going to have to have some help on how to get on and do this. And, uh, and I know the uh, seniors in rural America and small town America are going to need some adaptability uh, help. Um, we've been on a vaccination campaign at the Grange helping uh, to, to raise the comfort level in rural America. And uh, part of that comfort level is because they're not able to get access to the information they need and uh, then, as, as several pointed out, they can't get an appointment if they want one. So I think the whole healthcare area and the whole well-being area is one that uh, we probably haven't talked much about. Great, thank you. Paul, any, any final words? Otherwise, uh... yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that the th right now we're in a moment of crisis, right? The, the, the world is. and. Um, and, and that crisis, among many things, has exposed um, the fact that people don't have broadband in many places and they need it in order for them to participate in society and in, in the economy. So I hope that we don't waste this crisis, this moment, uh, and I hope that we can use it to push the, the uh, this policy agenda forward and, and, and make a lot more progress on these issues. Excellent. Thank you so much. So my apologies to everyone in the audience. There are a bunch of great questions that unfortunately we do not have time for. Um, we'll have to get this band back together for another event uh, here soon. But uh, but thank you all so much for your time, for the experts and also the audience. I hope this was a, uh, I think it was a very productive discussion. I hope it was useful uh, to people. Uh, obviously, we're at the sort of beginning stages of a, of a, a big push for, for these issues. And so uh, I think a very important conversation and one that we'll, we'll keep having in the uh, weeks and months to come. So with that, thank you all so much. Uh, really thank appreciate you. your time. And, uh, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.